Well, good afternoon to you all, and welcome to the Jacqueline de Bray Music Building for this afternoon's historic event, a rare performance of what has long been Sir Abdi's best known work, even though until the 1980s <coughs> it was rather more talked about than played. And a special welcome to those who come from outside this country to listen to this performance. Opus Clavicembalisticum, literally work for keyboard instrument. Just two words, nine syllables, but more than enough to instill a fear of God into even the most intrepid of pianists. I say a rare performance of Opus Clavicembalisticum, or OC as it's more commonly known, as this will only be its 17th performance the first being the composer's world premiere in Glasgow in 1930. But that rarity is disappearing fast. This afternoon, we're going to hear the third of at least seven public performances of it that Jonathan Powell is giving just this year. Of course, neither Jonathan nor Sorabji are strangers to the Jacqueline Dupre Music Building. Jonathan's given a number of performances here in recent years, including works as diverse as Albanian's Iberia, major pieces by Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, Alcan Rachmaninoff, works by Michael Finnessy, and the complete piano music of Zinakis. Yes, are there any other pianists that have all that in their repertoire? I rather doubt it. Late in 2014, he gave the UK premiere of one of the highlights of Sorabji's final years, his sixth and final symphony for piano solo, a work on a slightly larger scale, even than OC, completed when the composer was 84. Sorabji's music was only rarely performed before the mid-1970s. By then, only a few of his works had been published, and none had been for at least 40 years. Scores were very hard to come by. There were no commercial recordings. But since then, more than 40 discs have appeared, many scores have been edited and typeset, and there have been literally hundreds of performances and broadcasts of around 75 of his works in more than 30 countries. There could be no doubt then that Sorabji's star is very much in the ascendant. It's a pity that his work has taken so long to impact upon the consciousness of listeners, but the wait has been clearly more than worthwhile. The circumstances that conspired to keep his music off the concert platform for so many years are rather unusual. Born near London in 1892 to a Parsi father from Mumbai and an English mother, Sorabji's general and musical education appears to have been private and he never attended a conservatoire or a university. Very little of his early life is known, so it's impossible to determine what initially it was that attracted him to music. But it is known that during his teens, he developed an obsession with the latest trends in European and Russian music that clearly meant far more to him than the work of the established masters. This, of course, was no easy pursuit for him. No recordings, no broadcasts, very few public performances, no easy access to contemporary music scores in the largely backward-looking climate of Edwardian England. He must have, must have cut a very strange figure in those days. Few of his peers would have shared his enthusiasms for so wide a variety of largely unfamiliar new music. Unfamiliar in this country, that is. Debussy and Mahler, Bartok and Rachmaninoff, Strauss and Ravel, Mechner and Busoni, Erlis Stravinsky, even Schoenberg. For all this, Sorabi seems to have been a remarkably late starter as a composer. Elliot Carter and Michael Tippett were also late developers, but the former wrote extensively during his teens and the latter during his twenties. Even Beethoven didn't publish the three piano trios that are his official office one until he was aged twenty-two, but he'd written plenty of music before then. Sorabi, on the other hand, appears to have composed nothing at all until <coughs> reaching that age. So it's hard to figure out what he wants to do about those early enthusiasms, although it does seem as though he once contemplated a career as a writer and critic. There's some, something lost here. Sound seems to have changed. Mm. We all hear all that. Mm. Good. The case like that. His first known works were songs for voice and piano, mainly settings of uh, French symbolist poets, about Lenin, Baudelaire, and so on. A couple of piano concertos followed. And then in 1917, his first work for piano solo. Thank you. Sorry about this. Technical hitches. You won't get any of those when Jonathan starts to play. <clears throat> and after that, um, a, a single movement piano sonata that was to herald some 65 years of piano writing, at least 100 hours of music for his beloved instrument. Once the creative floodgates had opened, nothing would stem the Amazonian flow. 
His output of over 100 works ranges from aphoristic fragments, which play for a few seconds, to vast multi-movement symphonic behemoths occupying up to nine hours, each requiring a program to itself. Almost everything that he wrote includes the piano. Notable early influences were Ravel, Cyril Scott, and Scriabin, although his absorption of a vast conspectus of contemporary music broadened his perspective. Almost from the outset, he was singing with his own voice. Albéniz and Granados made their marks on one of his most popular works, the 1919 Fantasy Espagnole for piano. Scriabin is perhaps most in evidence and the second of his piano sonatas, also from 1919, the one known today as Sonata No. 1. But this work is what led to the un un what was undoubtedly the most significant influence in his youth, namely the composer who invited him to play it to him privately during a visit to London, Ferruccio Buzzoni. Buzzoni was then widely recognized as one of the finest pianists of his day, a worthy successor to Liszt indeed. But he was rather better known then as a pianist and transcriber than as a composer and conductor. Indeed, he ruefully remarked to his friend, the composer Bernard Van Deren, that publishers would only accept his works because of his fame as a pianist. Buzzoni was fascinated by this sonata and asked the composer what he wanted him to do about it. He replied to help me get it published. So Buzzoni wrote him a warm letter of recommendation and within months, publications of his music began to appear. It's probably from Buzzoni's Fantasia Contrapuntistica, Toccata and Bach transcriptions that Sorebdi developed an architectonic sensibility that came to inform a substantial proportion of his works from the early 1920s onwards. For example, the first of his three symphonies for organ solo includes a half hour long passacaglia and a double fugue. It's the first major work in which his predilection for Baroque forms in an extended way makes its presence felt. It was never to leave him. Max Reger is another important influence in this regard, and Sorabji's admiration for the work of both composers is well documented. Alongside this is a quite different predilection for the exotic and the mystical that he derived in part from Scriabin before coming under the spell of Szymanowski, another major influence. That he managed so successfully to merge intellectual rigor with the magical, sensuous, and fantastical in so much of his music is perhaps one of his most significant achievements. The scholar Simon Abrahams writes of it as exhibiting enormous variety in imagination and the ability to develop a unique personal style and to employ that style freely on any scale that he chose. Jonathan Powell comes even closer to an understanding of this when writing perceptively of Sorabji's unusual ability to combine the disparate and create surprising coherence. That's particularly true of the large-scale works like O.C. Well before these, the poet Hugh McDermott the delicatee of O.C., was struck by another fusion of opposites in Sorabji's music. In conversation with John Ogden and Ronald Stevenson in the early 1960s, he described the composer as a refutation in person of the idea that East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Sorabji's origins were, of course, both Eastern and Western, but his music is all conceived and expressed within an Occidental language and technique and scored for Western instruments. But it's fair to say that Sorabji did not set out to bring East and West together in his work, and any implication of such a meeting of cultures arose from his creative instinct, rather than from any sense of what I aim to do is. Having begun as something of an outsider, Sorabji the musician remained so throughout his active musical life. He did make some attempts in his early days <clears throat> to secure performances of his work, but he was a most unwilling performer himself, and he soon abandoned all concern for the fate of his music in order to concentrate his energies on setting it all down on paper, more than 11,000 pages of it. A modest private income afforded him the financial independence to do this. He didn't need an income from his work, and his life as a critic between the two world wars paid him but a pittance in any case. This artistic reclusiveness, though unusual, was not unique. Think of all the work that Charles Ives, Bernard Van Deren, Nikos Skalkotis, or Havagal Bryan composed with precious little expectation of widespread hearings. But none of these composers went to the length of discouraging public performances, as Sorapi did from the latter 1930s, averring that no performance at all is vastly better than an obscene travesty. That said, the main discouraging fact was actually the sheer technical difficulties of most of his work, even some of the shorter pieces. And as far as is known, only one such obscene travesty actually occurred, but which more later. 
There were a couple of significant exceptions to what was otherwise a lengthy silence. In 1930, the BBC invited Sorabdi to broadcast his poem for piano, Le Jardin Parfumé. It was the only BBC performance that he ever gave. Delius heard it and wrote very warmly about it too, Sorabdi. Even more important, there was a concert series mounted in Glasgow by an enterprising young Scottish composer who did more than anyone to put Sorabdi's music before audiences in those days. Eric I've got another one. <laughs> it's jinxed, I tell you, it's jinxed. <clears throat> there were a couple of significant exceptions to what was otherwise a lengthy silence. In 1930, the BBC invited Sorrent to broadcast his poem for piano, Le Jardin Parfumé. It was the only BBC performance he ever gave. Delius heard it and wrote warmly about it too, Sorrent I mentioned about Eric Chisholm. He founded and ran this series called the Active Society for the Propagation of Contemporary Music. All oh, they have long pieces, isn't it, really? Um, <clears throat> almost single-handedly. His main aim was to invite major composers to Scotland to perform and discuss their work. His ambitions in this, in Glasgow, during the depression of the 1930s, were so immense as to have seemed hopelessly unrealistic. And yet, through his indefatigable determination, he secured the services of Bartok, Metner, Szymanowski, Hindemith, Florent Schmidt and others. Although curiously, the composer who appeared in that series most frequently was that most reluctant of pianists, Sorabji, who came to play his work on no less than four occasions. Chisholm's powers of persuasion must have been truly extraordinary. By this time, Sorabji had had very few opportunities to hear his music played by anyone else. One exception was the middle movement of his first organ symphony given by Edward Emlyn Davies in London in 1928. This impressed not only him, but also William Walton, who wrote to the composer about it with fulsome enthusiasm. Spurred on by this experience, Sorabdi began work on his second organ symphony the following year, to be dedicated to Davies. However, Chisholm was then encouraging Sorabdi to visit Glasgow to give the world premiere of his recently completed fourth piano sonata. That was his first appearance in that series. At this time, Sorabdi interrupted work on the second organ symphony to embark on his largest and most ambitious piano piece of all, to that time, Opus Sequentiale. Chisholm was most excited by this prospect and very keen to secure its premiere, again at the composer's hands. With the organ symphony laid aside, Sorabji then concentrated on this piece, which, during its composition, he renamed, you guessed it, Opus Clavicembalisticum. The realization of this monumental conception, its 12 movements divided into three sections, obsessed the composer as never before. During the nine months that he worked on it, Yes, it only took him nine months. I don't know how he did it, really. <clears throat> he fired off all sorts of uh, work-in-progress reports to Chisholm, which I notice are actually in the programme, so you'll be able to read some of them. Um, but, so that in June 1930, he could finally write to him, with a racking head and literally my whole body shaking as with ague, I write this and tell you that I have just this afternoon early finished Clavicembalisticum. The closing four pages are as cataclysmic and catastrophic as anything I've ever done. The harmony bites like nitric acid. The counterpoint grinds like the mills of God. This fearsome aspect of the work is also illustrated in its dedication, which ends, and to the everlasting glory of those men, blessed and sanctified in the curses and execrations of those many whose praise is eternal damnation. Ouch. The arresting opening of, only, of, of OC, almost the only passage of monody in the entire work, might seem akin to the last trumpet in the book of Revelation or perhaps to the musical equivalent of the famous phrase from Dante's Inferno, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Not to mention the spirit that denies, of course, which you've just heard about. I'm not trying to put you off. There really are. Uh, there's, a, there's a rewarding cornucopia of riches to experience in OC, as you'll soon discover. Although, looking around, I think that a few of you may have discovered this already. After its 1930 premiere, O.C. was published the following year, but not heard in public in its entirety for more than half a century. It was printed by Waldheim in Vienna, a monumental task that must have been uni uniquely problematic. One copy of the pro publication proofs remains in private hands. The other, intriguingly, was presented by Waldheim to Alban Berg. Sorabji had performed two of his piano sonatas in Vienna a decade earlier, but there's no evidence that Berg attended. 
There is, however, a fascinating parallel between a passage in Sorabji's Le Jardin Parfumé from 1923 and the open string figure at the beginning of Berg's 1935 violin concerto. It's probably pure coincidence, but it can't be discounted that Berg might have seen the score. Sorabji gave up performing in 1936. The Dutch pianist Egon Petri, Bozoni's most distinguished student, considered preparing OC for performance, but confessed that it would take him more time than he could spare for it. It's not the most career-friendly of pieces, after all. Peter Maxwell Davis acquired a copy of the publication in the early 1950s, and he showed it to his fellow student, John Ogden, earning him to, urging him to learn the work, which he did. Well, he devoured it, actually. John seems to have given a private performance of it to Malcolm Williamson and possibly also Davies himself in the latter 1950s, and a further one in the home of Ronald Stevenson in 1959 in the presence of his dedicatee. In between these events, John studied with Egon Petri in Basel, although it's not known whether the two ever discussed OC, but Petri did tell Sorabji afterwards that John was the most gifted student that had ever passed through his hands. Meanwhile, in the mid-1950s, Maxwell Davis orchestrated O.C.'s first two movements. Fascinating as it would be to see this score, it, all my efforts to track it down have come to naught. It seems to have been given away and then Max forgot what he'd done with it. Who knows? It might turn up again. Unending supply of these. <laughs> so anyway, um, Max Davis's score, who knows, it might turn up one of these days. So if anyone here happens to know of its whereabouts, or better still, actually has it, please let me know. In 1980, the Australian pianist Geoffrey Douglas Madge gave some partial performances of OC before playing the whole work in 1982. He subsequently performed it on five further occasions. John Ogden made a studio recording of it in the mid-1980s, which was released to great acclaim in 1989, just a few months after Sorabji's death, aged 96, and three months before his own, aged just 52. Jonathan Powell came, a came across a copy of the publication during his teens, and he eventually gave his first performance of it in 2003. He, too, has since given five more performances of it. The structural outline of OC is unusual, even for a large-scale Sorabji work. Many of his massive keyboard works include a fugue, but OC, uniquely, has no less than four of them, a single, a double, a triple, and a quadruple fugue of increasing scale, scope, contrast, and complexity. These appear at various points throughout its course and contrast greatly with its other movements, an introito, a chorale prelude, a theme and variations, a fantasia, two cadenzas, Sorabji revered Bozzoni, idealized him indeed. O.C.'s fugal impetus clearly derives from that in Bozzoni's Fantasia Contrapuntistica, but the example of that work doesn't end there. O.C.'s introito introduces a theme that also makes its presence felt in the chorale prelude that follows, and its contours bear so remarkable a similarity to the chorale theme in the Bozzoni that it must be more than mere coincidence. I'm sure you'll be relieved at this point you know, that, I will, I, that I shall spare you all a blow-by-blow blow account of what happens in OC. We'll hear the whole thing soon enough, expressed with far more elegance and eloquence with each page of piano playing than I could possibly attempt in a detailed description of the entire work. By the time that Sorabji came to compose OC, his pianistic <coughs> manner and harmonic language were well established and immediately identifiable as his own. In his youth, he'd made an extensive study of the keyboard music, not only of Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, and Rachmaninoff, but also that of then lesser known masters of the piano, such as Alcan, Bozzani, Godofsky, and Metner. From all of this, he acquired an acute sense of the piano's unique expressive power as an instrument capable of almost anything. From Liszt, Alcan, and Godofsky in particular, he absorbed the higher echelons of pianistic possibility and developed a sense of overwhelming virtuosity that was to inform almost everything he wrote for the piano. In this pursuit, his friend Hugh McDermott encouraged him to be as fearless as possible without worrying what anybody else might think. Although Sorabji had largely abandoned concerns as to whether pianists could meet the extraordinary demands of his music, the performances and recordings over the past few decades showed he never lost sight of what was practically possible for the pianist, given due gifts and vast resources of patience. It might not be too much to say that any pianist capable of doing justice to the most challenging works of Liszt, Alcar, and Godofsky has the equipment to do the same for Sorabji's. 
only the additional stamina is on top. However outrageously ambitious his music might have seemed to some at the time, he felt very much a part of an ongoing pianistic tradition, and with very good reason. As to the harmonic language, tonality is present at almost all times, though his reliance on it differs rather from that of other tonal composers. Sorabji's youthful espousal of contemporary music came to wane as he attained creative maturity. He found himself increasingly at odds with middle to late Stravinsky. He deplored Schoenbergian serialism and distanced himself even farther from the kinds of trends in post-war music that were to find favor in Darmstadt and elsewhere. However, much as Schoenberg sought to develop a system of composing with 12 tones equal to one another, it could be said that Sorabji pursued an approach to tonal harmonies based on a similar equality of the 12 major and minor keys rather than gravitating around tonal centers, as it were. His work is likewise peppered with irregular scale patterns rather than those suggestive of particular tonalities. That said, in OC in particular, an occasional sense of tonal centers does make its presence felt. D sharp minor, the first chord heard in the piece, underpins some of the introito and turns up at nodal points later on in the work. C sharp major likewise impacts as though a kind of punctuation. The theme and variations, the third fugue, the adagio and the passacaglia all end in that key. Ultimately though, perhaps the most consistent and significant tonality is that of G sharp minor, which imbues parts of the chorale prelude and ends the first and second fugues as well as, no, I'm not gonna spoil it by giving that away. I'd like to conclude now with a few words about my own route into Sorabji's music and then about today's artist, Jonathan Powell. Although not a pianist, I've been investigating piano literature during my student days along lines similar to those pursued by Sorabji in his youth. It's quite by chance that I happened upon a copy of O.C. in Westminster Library. It sparked my curiosity. I'd never even heard of Sorabji. So what I discovered upon opening that massive blue oblong tome came as an immense shock. I didn't borrow it from the library because I knew that I couldn't even begin to fumble through any of it at sight in a practice room. So what I did instead was to spend some four hours in the library going through it with increasing astonishment. It was quite unlike any piano music I'd ever encountered. The superhuman challenges that had set the pianist seemed like Alcan multiplied by Godofsky and then some and then some, but it was the music itself that conveyed such a sense of excitement and thrill as it left off the page, leapt off the page into my mind's ear. I was surprised that I'd never previously encountered the composer, even more surprised that no pianist had ever so much as mentioned his name in my hearing. My time with this gripping score on that occasion ended when a librarian tapped me on the shoulder and advised me that it was closing time. That had never happened to me in a library before. I tried with limited success and increasing frustration to find other Sorabji scores and information about the composer but I cannot ever remember coming up against so many dead ends, leads that led nowhere. I talked to my, my teachers, Stephen Savage and Humphrey Searle about my discovery and found to my relief that each knew something of his work and that Searle had even attended a Sorabji performance. Edmund Robra had reviewed O.C.'s publication in the Monthly Musical Record magazine in 1931. Sorabji's friend John Ireland introduced his pupil, Searle, to Robra at around that time. Rubra enthused about O.C. to him, urging him not to miss an opportunity to attend a performance of it should one ever arise. Searle duly acquired the score and studied it. He was then delighted to find that his part one was to be performed in London in 1936 and attended the concert, only to be bitterly disappointed by the lacklustre and unengaging performance given by the hapless, if well-meaning, pianist. Contemporary reports suggested it took at least twice as long to pay, play part one as it should have done, so it must have been quite an ordeal, and it would hardly be surprising if Sorabji regarded it as an obscene travesty. He said that he never actually attended the performance, but he did. He didn't stay till the end, just as well, probably. It's possible that this bitter experience in front of a number of distinguished composers, performers, critics, and writers on music set the seal on Sorabji's decision henceforward to veto public performances of his music without his express consent. It might also have hardened his resolve to cease performing after premiering his Toccata Seconda in Glasgow for Chisholm at the end of 1936. These were drastic and courageous steps to take, of course, but the fear of obscene travesties is hardly an unreasonable one for a composer keen to protect his work from misinterpretation and misunderstanding. And which composer wouldn't want to do that? Stephen Savage encouraged me to try to contact Sorabji to break down the barriers and to explore what might be done towards getting his music to be better known. This required considerable courage too. 
but it led to my many meetings with the composer beginning in 1972. Where are those 45 years gone? A few years later, I had the pleasure to meet the pianist Yonti Solomon, whose enthusiasm for Sorabji had been encouraged by Chisholm when he was dean of the music faculty at Cape Town University, where Yonti had studied in the 1950s. An historic series of Sorabji performances from Yonti followed, and the rest, as they say, is history. The main problem affecting the fate of Sorabji's music was availability of scores. Only 14 of his works had ever been published, and the selling agency for these was assumed by Oxford University Press in 1938, but with no performances, copies sold very slowly. However, following Yonti's advocacy, sales began to increase, but when stocks ran out of each publication, there were no reprint plans in place. I well remember Sorabji ruefully telling me that OC was the last of his works to get into print, and now it had become the first to go out of it. The dilemma was obvious. So the Sorabji archive was set up in the mid-1980s to make master copies of all the scores and published literary writings so as to enable their distribution and to ensure the preservation of the composer's legacy. The archive then sought to encourage scholars to edit these works so that they could be read easily by potential performers. This was essential, as the manuscript, often written at vast speed, were hardly models of legibility. This ongoing project has developed greatly since then. 74 scores have now been edited and several more editions are in progress. The early editions had to be prepared by hand, but the advent and development of music setting software has since made typesetting possible. One of a number of scholars who has prepared several excellent typeset editions is Jonathan Powell. In the archive's early days, I feared that at best perhaps a few performers might each include just one or two Sorabji works in their repertoires, given the problems involved in preparing these fantastically difficult pieces. But how wrong I was. Yonti himself, as well as Michael Haberman and Donna Amato, each performed several uh, and recorded several of them. What I did not anticipate, even then, was the work that Jonathan Powell was to accomplish. To date, he has committed no less than 22 Sorabji works to his repertoire, as well as the piano parts of several of the songs for soprano and piano, which he's performed with Sarah Leonard and Laurie Luxemburg. In all, he has some 30 hours worth of Sorabji's piano writing under his fingers a most remarkable achievement and way beyond anyone else's in this field. Jonathan's many performances and recordings of this music brush aside any sense that it might be freakish, uncompromising, unreasonable, or anything else that could dissuade some listeners from involvement. He treats it as though it merits acceptance as standard repertoire for the pianist. Well, it does, so why not? The journey on which Jonathan is about to take you is a long and varied one with many byways. However, Sorabji's innate structural sense was always paramount. His current concern was never to overstate or to understate, but to ensure that every moment, every phrase, every section is of appropriate length in proportion to what precedes it and what follows it. So, as you absorb this remarkable work, it will become ever clearer that the bigger picture is neither more nor less important than any of the coruscating detail that informs his narrative. After a short interval, I shall leave you in the unique hands of Jonathan Powell to relate to you the story that is OC. But in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much.